Hey, this is Vaughn Vernon. Welcome to my Design Accelerator tutorials. It's brought to you by my company, Kalele. You can find us at kalele.io and you can learn more about my IDDD workshop at kalele.io slash IDDD workshop. Today I'm going to discuss with you go with the flow upstream to downstream. This has to do a lot with context mapping and domain driven design, but you can take it also as general advice for software development, whether or not you are using domain driven design. So thanks for joining me today. Let's get into this topic. So how do we understand the flow of information between, let's say, two microservices? You have one microservice here, another here, and there is some kind of dependency where some information will flow from one of these microservices to another. How do we represent that? What's a good way to think about it? Well, we tend to use a lot of water analogies in software development. So let's try another water analogy here. First of all, think of this microservice publishing an event that will need to flow to this microservice because this microservice has an interest in this domain event. So it's going to flow this way to the microservice. You're probably wondering, okay, how would that flow work? Well, here comes the water analogy. Let's say that the event is a paper boat and the paper boat can float on the water and be carried to the other microservice. That's cool. I mean, Everybody loves paper boats, right? Thing is, the boat can only actually get from the owning microservice, the publishing microservice, over to the consuming microservice if there is a flow from upstream to downstream or if the boat has a lot of power to it. Well, right now, we're not dealing with power boats. We're dealing with paper boats. And unless you get a breeze that's blowing the event across here, it's just not going to work very well to actually make this trip. So we need an upstream downstream relationship. So that's what we've got here. Now we've positioned this drawing such that it has the appearance that this microservice that publishes the domain event is upstream from the microservice that has an interest and consumes the event. So to improve this diagram, what we're doing now is marking the upstream bounded context or microservice as a bounded context with a U for upstream and the downstream a D with downstream. So it makes sense that the flow goes this direction. It's not that you absolutely have to have an upstream downstream relationship to exchange information, but it does show one important way of doing that. This means that the upstream context or the upstream microservice doesn't really know anything about the downstream. At least it shouldn't. It's just simply publishing an event to a topic or exchange of its selection and it flows down to the other microservice through that topic or exchange using a messaging mechanism. This kind of upstream downstream relationship also has another important factor. It's that the downstream context or the downstream microservice doesn't really have to know much about the upstream either. It just knows about what's called a published language or the message schemas that it's receiving that packs the domain events into those messages. So there is a big advantage in having an upstream downstream relationship. It sort of forces everybody to put themselves in the best position to not know much about each other. Although the downstream does have to know about the schemas or the event types that are coming from the upstream and delivered here to the downstream. But let's get serious about this. I mean, there is no water after all, and who likes paper boats anyway? So you have a domain event that flows from an upstream microservice to the downstream microservice. It's as simple as that. 
Now there's still kind of a problem here or could become a very big problem and that is when the event is consumed by the downstream microservice, what happens from there? Do we just consume it right into the internals of the microservice and we take a sort of deep knowledge about this event type? Or what could we do to change that? Well, this is where when the microservice receives the domain event, it can translate it to a command and the command belongs to the ubiquitous language of the downstream model. So the idea is that you're turning information that is saying this happened into something that says do this within this microservice. This is a very typical pattern used in event-driven architecture. Now, when I say translate the event into a command, I'm not talking about this sort of lazy way out where you see an event flow from the upstream and the upstream event is named proposal submitted, for example, and you were just to say, well, let's translate proposal submitted into handle proposal submitted. No, that's not the right idea. That's just basically a lazy approach to this, and it really isn't the spirit of, if you're at all interested in using domain-driven design, of using the ubiquitous language of the downstream. So, what do we do? Well, whatever the purpose of the downstream model, this proposal submitted event needs to be translated into an imperative, a command that says, do this very special thing according to what our model is responsible for. So for example, if we need to have pricing verified for the proposal that was submitted, then the command could be, for example, verify pricing. And verify pricing would be in the ubiquitous language of the downstream model. Now I've heard some people say, well, why should I translate proposal submitted or whatever the name of the domain event is? I'll just create a shared kernel and I will make proposal submitted part of the shared kernel and we will just share that event and other events between the two bounded contexts or between the two microservices. Well, if you're using domain driven design and the shared kernel context mapping pattern or context mapping relationship, that is really not the purpose of a shared kernel. And besides, you remove the upstream downstream relationship in that case, which means that these two are, if they're using a shared kernel, there is no such upstream downstream. It's really just that the relationship between the two is to share the very model, in fact, we can even remove this line if I can get to that. I can remove the line and now each of these bounded contexts is using the shared kernel as a part of each one's model. But that really isn't the, again, the spirit of domain events. A shared kernel should be used for a real model a part of a model that applies to at least two bounded contexts. So you just really wouldn't use a shared kernel for the purpose of, in essence, a library of schemas that you're going to exchange between the two. In fact, if you're going to exchange languages in that way, what this really would be in that case is known as a partnership between the two. So this relationship now would be a partnership and again that's really not the spirit of partnership because even the fact that you're going to share a domain event type between the two because you're in a partnership well again that's just going to pollute the other bounded context or corrupt its model with something that really doesn't belong to it. Proposal submitted is not something that two partners would share in that way. You would still want to do the translation between proposal submitted and, for example, 
verify pricing command over here because the partnership is more about cooperation in features, not in sharing a ubiquitous language. So you would still want to translate this when it enters the other bounded context or microservice as a bounded context. So the relationship that would actually exist in the way that those think that, well, let's just share proposals submitted between the two bounded contexts or microservices would be the conformist relationship. Now, I have to say, warning, conformist relationship is not something you want to use on a regular basis. For example, you don't want every model that integrates with other models to conform to those models or those models to conform to it. That is really not the purpose of the conformist relationship. A conformist is for the very express purpose of having an upstream model that is just better and at being what it needs to be than anything that you could produce in the downstream. For example, it could be a calendar, it could be an editor, it could be some kind of model like that, or it could be a very large insurance or medical model or something like that, that you have to integrate with and you may need some sort of specialty operations down here, but most of the model will be shared with the upstream. So you could see receiving some events, but actually in that case, I don't know that you would see a lot of events in, in conformance. Let's say that you do see events, but still you are allowing an upstream model to have a very heavy influence down here. In fact, you are just mimicking the model, or you've perhaps even taken a library or an SDK into your model, and you are using the upstream, let's say, calendar model exactly as it is here. But the reason that you're doing that is you don't specialize in developing SaaS calendars, for example. Google does that. Microsoft does that. Other companies do that. So just use an upstream SaaS model and conform to it, but you'll still do some special things in the downstream model. It's larger than a shared kernel because it's not just part of a model that two will share, but the conformist is when you're really heavily dependent on the upstream and you have very minimal to do down here, just some specialty modeling to do down here. Using any of Domain Driven Design's context mapping relationships is a strategy. So you have to think of it not in technical terms only, but as a true strategic approach to modeling. If there is an advantage to using the conformist relationship, then you use it, but it is a business decision it is not just a technical decision. This can happen, for example, if you just do not have the bandwidth to do some kind of translation down here. And it's just not worth it to try to become sort of an augmented calendar of the upstream. Instead, you just want to let them be the calendar and you're going to do some specialty things down here that apply only to your internal enterprise, whatever system it is that you're designing and building. So think of it as a strategy. The shared kernel is a strategy. There is an advantage sometimes to sharing a very small portion of a model between various bounded contexts. And when I talk about microservices, I'm talking about bounded context as microservice, okay, in general doesn't mean that you always should use microservices for bounded context. No, I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. That isn't the point at all. But any of these relationships that I've been discussing, partnership, shared kernel, conformist, or any of those things, really you are more interested in the business strategy of doing so. It's a kind of buy versus build, but it's not a buy because well, we don't know how to do that. If it's more strategic to build because that is a specialty 
that is a competitive advantage to your organization, then you're going to use a strategic approach and you will do the heavy lifting for a complex model in a core domain, a core bounded context. So we have to really get in, have in mind the very express purpose of using various context mapping relationships. Today, I'm just really talking about the upstream downstream, but trying to show you that you don't just sort of, you know, irresponsibly choose conformist or shared kernel or something like that, because somehow it seems to relate to some experience that you have and you think of shared kernel as a library. And therefore, yes, well, we love libraries, don't we? But that isn't the purpose of shared kernel at all, is to share a very specific portion of a model between two bounded contexts. So just be really careful in how you use these strategic design approaches because they are about strategy. So using domain-driven design does not mean that you have to use microservices. In fact, as you can see here, I've represented a monolith with multiple bounded contexts inside it. Of course, this is a modular monolith, but to simply say it is a modular monolith misses the point. The modules internally are separate bounded contexts, or I should say the top level modules. So you're not just modularizing a monolith. Of course, modules are better than not having modules or having the right modules are better than having a few and the wrong mod modules. But again, this is about using domain-driven design in a monolith. And in that case, you're really focused on the bounded context and of course the modules within the bounded context, but each bounded context is then separated into a unique high level module of its own. So no, you don't have to use microservices constantly for the purpose of doing domain-driven design. Using a monolith works just fine and there are trade-offs for both approaches. I hope you benefited from my tutorial today. Remember, strategic design is very important. It's really the most important part of domain-driven design. Bounded context with context mapping. Whether you're using microservices or a monolith, domain-driven design is quite important. If you enjoyed this tutorial today and if you benefited from it, this is just a tiny little example of what I cover in my Implementing Domain-Driven Design workshop. You can find more information at kalele.io slash IDD workshop. And as I said in my previous tutorial, I will be teaching uh, just coming up in a few days now from this tutorial on the last week in January, I'll be teaching my 4.0 version of the IDD workshop. It is a very project-based approach to learning where we're going to start from the very beginning without anything, with basically just a business plan and problem that we face with some systems that we've already developed. And we're going to learn how to develop a ubiquitous language for each bounded context, where the uh, subdomains are within a problem space domain. And we're going to do discovery-based learning, strategic design, tactical modeling, all using domain-driven design and related tools. So I hope that you'll join us for that. Look us up at kalele.io and specifically at kalele.io idd-workshop. Thanks so much for listening today and we'll see you next time.